Okay, so next up, we have Niels Torbert. Uh, Niels is the VP of Advanced Technology at Verimatrix uh, and is responsible for innovation and research in areas such as digital watermarking, IoT security, and machine learning. Since April 2005, Niels uh, is spearheading content security innovation efforts to meet and exceed requirements of content owners and digital TV operators resulting in, uh, among else, a Verimatrix video mark and stream mark forensic video watermarking technologies. Prior experience includes research activity at the Fraunhofer uh, Society and guiding the technology development media sec Inc. in Providence, Rhode Island, and Essen, Germany, uh, from the company inception to acquisition. Uh, Mr. Torbert has published several international papers and obtained various patents in the field of digital rights management and digital watermarking, like we were just talking about. He holds uh, an MSc in uh, computer science and business management from University of Mannheim, Germany, and University of Nice, Sophia, and Top Antopolis, France. Please welcome near Nils Torbier. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the introduction, for hosting this, and uh, for getting almost all the names right. <laughs> That's a rare one for me. Um, hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, thanks also to the previous speaker. I think this is a nice group, a nice symposium. I think what we're getting together is maybe different opinions on the, the strengths of the blockchain and how to use it. Um, what I want to do is go through the design of transaction, design of a specific blockchain to, to solve one, one uh, very single use case only. And that has to do with content rights. It's content rights, how we manage uh, people consuming content. That's what I've been doing for more than a decade with very matrix um, and Looking into blockchain. I admit I had a very similar approach to many um, Here's a solution and I'm looking for a problem um, Honestly, there were a lot of problems that I couldn't solve with that um, Copyright is one I do believe there's you know tracking ability that is good to have a blockchain but there are other areas where copyright is just a gray area, where you're not sure whether you can use that and who you need to pay. The blockchain is not going to solve that. Um, but looking into it, we, we uh, did find a use case. And looking at different use case, one definition was very helpful to me on what a blockchain is. The way I see it is simply an optimization. It just does something better, meaning something better that already exists. So if you have a process that exists, uh, you can decentralize it. I think that's the main advantage. Uh, killer application obviously is money. It existed before, paper, plastic. Now you add a decentralized cryptocurrency. Makes a lot of sense. Um, the advantages I see, the, the main advantages is that it's stable and that it's long lasting. And I realize it's a little out there to claim that. Technology is barely 10 years old. I think next week the uh, Satoshi paper is exactly 10 years old. Um, so it's not that old. Um, because I'm thinking in, in a scale of centuries. Um, I'm thinking of um, providing stabilities where governments can't. And I can see the sense of it when I look at my grandma. She lived to be 104 years old. She lost all her money twice. She grew up and lived in Germany, two world wars. Um, Estonia, very little company, gets invaded left and right over the last years or centuries. Um, when invaders come in, they may delete all the records, create chaos, a blockchain, maybe a tool that survives that, that is decentralized and that's permanent. I also think it's stable. And here again, maybe you see the irony given the fluctuation in, in cryptocurrency, but all these approaches have maintained their value as a store of money. Of course, they have changed in value, because I think it's because investors embrace that as a, as a value store, as an, as an additional way to invest. But um, the, the basic underlying system has helped. 
So one of the advantages, and that's something Shruti mentioned, on, on decentralization is um, you can get the man in the middle, you can get the big companies out of the equation where it makes sense. To me, it only makes sense if there's an equation where they have been in and where it works. One of these areas is content rights. So typically those content rights are controlled by a single company or entity. And I mean um, iTunes. iTunes and Amazon, I think, today have more than 50% of their electronic sales through um, items, or at least a large, large share thereof. There's uh, Key Chess, there's um, Ultraviolet, there's Blu-ray, DVD. All those are systems um, that are controlled by individual entities that um, maintain the content rights. Um, a very similar approach, and I mentioned the DVD. It's actually fairly nice. I think for me as a consumer, I trust the DVD because if I have this device and I have a player, uh, if I have the disc, sorry, if I have the disc and I have the player, I put them together, I can see a movie. So I don't need the studio to be around anymore. I don't need to be the manufacturer of the device to be around anymore. I, if I put them together, I can play it. Of course, there's a downside with the physical media. So that's why nice, it would be nice to be, to be electronic. Um, but these other vices, central entities, if I buy something from iTunes, um, Apple needs to be around and they need to maintain a motivation to serve that content up to me, otherwise my content is lost. And I think this is one specific use case where blockchain can help, where blockchain can decentralize it and, and encode the rights permanently. And here's how that would work. The basic idea of blockchain, it, it manages transactions. So you register something and then you can look it up in the future. Here, you, um, a studio or content owner may register that they have a movie. They, and they prove that by adding a hash code um, and a certain timestamp. So they prove that you know, at a certain time they had possession of it and they can embrace a user and encode the rights. So now I know I can, I can watch this content. Now, this specific example is focusing on rights content. So I don't know where you get your content from. There are other providers, there's CDNs, maybe you have other, maybe blockchain enabled uh, ways of storing the content, but I'm focusing on the rights transaction that is encoded here. Um, and this is already a system to distribute the content. There's one company out there, LBRY, uh, pronounced library, that do a good job of that, I think, um, and distributes the content. Um, this helps you to track who can watch the content. But this blockchain system does not allow you to protect it. It doesn't keep your content safe or your script. If you put a script in there, somebody can still look at it and, and copy it and put it elsewhere. Um, and this is what content owners don't like. I mean, they, they produce this movie for uh, many millions and they don't want to allow people to just copy it. They want to protect it. And this is what we do. This is what we do traditionally as Ray Matrix as a company to provide DIM to make sure it's um, in a secure environment on the playback. And I think there might be a little philosophy mismatch from, from some people or some um, publications I read where um, blockchain is this free open system and everybody has access to it and there's no control over it. While uh, DRM is a system that's you know, very much controlled and kind of limits on what you can do, I, I don't think it's a difference. I think this can work together. To do so, I'm looking at what content protection requirements are today. So you encrypt the content, meaning the content itself is not useful unless you have a key to, add to, to get to it. And then you play it in an environment that is using those keys and protect them. Meaning a player gets these keys, decrypts the content, and keeps the keys secure. Again, that's what we do. That's what um, PlayReady, Whitevine do. There are other systems in place. Um, so the players need to have a certain security, a certain level that content owners trust in this. They need to use uh, HTCP. They need to use a certain encryption links. They need to. Uh, vary the content. There are, there are robust tools that are published on that. Uh, um, 
and, and that's why content owners trust it. They allow a certain Android version or a certain iTunes version to, to deal with their content because they, they think um, it keeps it reasonably safe, reasonably safe given the release window and resolution uh, and value of the content, basically. So this is the traditional um, requirements for content protection, but they can be translated into blockchain quite easily, I believe. The main idea, and back to our uh, diagram here, is that you encrypt the content, you distribute the keys, and you distribute the keys to a certain player, to a certain media player. So now you need this player to play back the content. But if you have that, if you have the right encoded in the blockchain, if you have the media player, now you can put them together and you can play. You don't need iTunes around anymore, you don't need the studio around anymore. The blockchain basically contains your license file, your right to play back the content. And this is distributed, others have that, there's a transaction, you can show that, you can show you have that value, um, and there might be other transactions you can use to sell it. But basically what's registered is that the content owner has a content, the content our owner trusts a certain player, and then the content owner has sold a license to an individual. And that's what's encoded in the, in the chain. And if the media player looks that up, then they say, yes, that's good, and I play it back. This is something the media player does today. Again, for Whitevine or, or PlayReady or a very matrix system, it goes back to some database, to some head end, verifies whether the license is okay. And you need to trust the player just like in this model. So this is how I suggest to marry the two otherwise maybe different systems. So let's look into some of the implications here um, and maybe some of the areas that, that Steve mentioned specifically. Those are the, the blockchain criteria, the blockchain issues we, we have faced and we have thought through and worked through with this project, but also another blockchain project we are involved in for IoT. Scale, how many transactions can you do with that? Um, so as Steve mentions, it's seven for Bitcoin, but it's actually more like 70 for, for Ethereum per second. And according to my you know, research, I don't have the internal numbers, but that's about the, the scale for selling uh, on iTunes. So already with today's technology, you can capture a big, big share of the market. If you want to track every view, you need more scale. You need to wait for, for blockchain technology to mature. Um, but it's, it's always going to be limited, there's always going to be friction, and we talked about pricing before, uh, the cost of that. Um, blockchain is just very, very inefficient. So there's a cost to that. It's slow, and there's a, um, and there's a monetary cost to that to also pay for it. But I think the scale is, is justified here, and I think also the transaction cost is, is justified generally for use case like this. Um, security, so how do you make sure the content doesn't leak? Well, basically, you're the same way you do today. You can't always make sure you try your best, and that's the same here. If you certify a player and then DVD gets cracked or Blu-ray gets cracked, you might want to renew that for your next big title, for your next early release. You might want to have different requirements on different players, but you don't have to. Um, and it should be backwards compatible, meaning this, the one title you got to play on the, this one player should always work and you'll always be able to use that. That's, that's sort of the promise ingrained in this approach. Privacy. So that's also an interesting one. How do we make sure um, that people's consumption habits and their libraries are not public if they don't want to? The basic idea is it's just like cryptocurrencies today. That's the, the, the start of it where anybody can observe what everybody else has. Everybody can observe every library. They just don't know who's behind it. So for cryptocurrencies, you know how, much, how many coins are out there. You can see the size of every single wallet. You don't know who owns it. So that's a good start, and then you can, of course, obfuscate, obfuscate it more, and players can obfuscate who has what. But there's also the advantage. There is the possibilities 
for um, clients, for consumers to actually sell their data, to prove that they have the certain data and how often they watch content, and that's something consumers may want to monetize and, and other agencies might want to acquire. So there's an additional, additional option for that. Another topic, public versus permissioned. And then I'm gonna go a little bit about how we did the implementation, some of the choices on blockchain, and I hope I leave a little time for questions as well. So public versus permissioned, and that's, that's a big area we thought about for a long time. Um, if you wanna get around some of the problems I mentioned earlier, you tend to choose a, a permission blockchain. You can make it very quick. You trust everybody in there. Um, nobody is, is writing data in there that's maybe illegal. You can keep stuff confidential, but you need to manage who comes in and, and who is part of this. So um, if you have somebody who gives the logins out, um, if you have somebody who, who is uh, managing who can contribute and who cannot, it looks very much like a database. A, a secure database, a database that has maybe signed transactions, but there is a central entity nonetheless. If you make it completely open, if you just say everybody can, can participate, um, you have what you have today with cryptocurrencies, you have a risk of people um, submitting illegal information. Everybody can use it to store stuff. Um, some of it you might not want to store on a corporate network. People may abuse it, and whatever abuse means, but for Ethereum, the CryptoKittens are a very popular application with a lot of transactions to trade virtual cats, I guess. So with so much transactions that actually for the real use case, if you want to call it that, uh, for cryptocurrencies, transactions had significantly slowed. Um, and then there's cost. If everybody can, can get to it, then mining is uh, expensive, a lot of people compete to mine to offer their proof of work. It makes it very difficult and very expensive to work. Very hard to calculate uh, the transaction cost. Uh, Eric mentioned how much it is now and how much it varies. You don't know how much transaction cost will be in 10 years. You don't know if you wanna license it to a million people, how much you're gonna pay for it. So we actually worked on a um, intermediate version of that. And it's a little bit between the public and permission, but it's still decentralized. It's a very team project. Uh, it's an open source project. It's on GitHub. It's on veryteam.org. Um, and it's a very light branch of Ethereum. That means, you know, a small modification to Ethereum that offers some of the remedies to those problems. Um, the basic idea for consensus um, is proof of authority. That means you need to have the authority. You need to be part of an elected group, if you will, in order to close a block and do mining. Unlike proof of work, where you show that you have processing cycles and that you can solve a hash challenge, here you just say, this is who I am. Now again, who has the authority? Interesting enough, that's not one single company that says you're part of it and you are not, but this is a self-regulating group. Um, this, is the, the, this is not something we invented, it's a click protocol that's part of Ethereum. And it allows the membership to vote on their own membership. So it's like a SIMTI group or a standard group that incorporates other members if it makes sense. It also allows, um, and that's to, to Steve's point, it also allows for this group to expel members that are not wanted. And they might not want it um, because garbage in, garbage out or the poop emojis. <laughs> um, so the group can say, this guy is not behaving um, correct and, and expel them. So it changes the incentive for mining. So unlike mining with cryptocurrencies, where you do it in order to make money, in order to get a Bitcoin or some Ether, here you mine because you wanna maintain the ecosystem, you wanna be part of this community and stay with it. And that's, that's why you do it. In addition, with this system, you're actually known. You're not synonymous, uh, not anonymous. People know who you are. So if you act wrongly, um, it can be pointing back to you as a motivation to not act maliciously, as a motivation to not do what you could otherwise do with a 51% attack. 
However, the system here um, is still, has still Byzantine fault tolerance, meaning that if an individual acts badly, they cannot take down the system. Unlike other consensus algorithms like RAF, where you trust one person, and if this person is bad, they actually can do significant damage. Here, the miners are chosen uh, pseudo-randomly, and if one miner doesn't do the right thing, uh, the, the other more than 50% will correct it. So with this system, what we enable is, is an open read, meaning everybody can verify the transaction. Everybody can verify who has content rights and what player can play content. And that's very important. That's very different from other open chains. Uh, we looked at Hyperledger, mainly Fabric. We looked at uh, Quorum. To what I understand, there, there's a permission system. Everything is behind a firewall. Either you're trusted or you're not. If you're trusted, you can read and write. If you're not, you can't exit at all. Here, we have a trusted self-regulating group uh, that can write and that can mine. And those could be the studios. That could be the content distributors. And you have everybody who can verify it. There are different systems to enable the same uh, content protection system. It's not like you need a very team approach. Uh, you could do it with colored coins. You could do it on a, on a public Ethereum. But here, this is a, a separate chain. It's, it's not the public Ethereum. It's not bound to cryptocurrency. It doesn't have the same transaction cost. It's something that's, that's stood up uh, independently of it. Um, yeah, and, and those, you know, as a summary, those are, those are the guardians um, that contribute, that write to the, to the content, and that can uh, mine and, and close blocks. That's basically it. Hoping for some questions. We still have some time. Morning. Thank you for the great presentation on that. I have two questions. One should be simpler than the other. Um, first one is, I just want to verify that the content being transaction, so a contract, for example, or a media asset, is not actually in the blockchain. It's just that the transaction itself occurs in the blockchain? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And the other one is, um, the last couple of you really talked about, you've talked about end user here, although I'm not sure you sort of, I don't know. Let me just ask the question. Um, if, uh, since you know the transaction of the end user in this use case, if that end user were to then distribute the content, you would be able to track that back through auditing the blockchain. Is that a correct assumption, or are there exceptions in that? No, actually, actually it's not. Um, so if somebody has the content here and gets it through the blockchain, They can, if, if they get this through the blockchain, they get the content, they play it back, they play back the video, and they record it. They have an unencrypted version that they can share. So they can do piracy. And I don't see the blockchain doing anything about it. Because this content looks like everybody else's content. You don't know where it comes from. Now, you could put a digital watermark in it to know where it comes from, and that's the, the other topic I'm working on. But um, different topic. here. In the simplest case, everybody gets the same, the very same content, and if they um, record the content and distribute it, nothing the blockchain can do about it. The additional idea here is um, trying to prevent that. So including security in the player so that people cannot record it. HTCP, you know, a secured environment, a trusted execution environment, so that the keys are secure and that the end user cannot easily, easily record it. So you block it at, you know, you block it at this, at this stage. And, and what's important for that is that um, the end user cannot just download it and, and play it on VLC, but that, you know, allows you to transcode it and just save it somewhere else, but that they only can apply it on players that act correctly with this content, only players that are trusted, only players where studios say, OK, you, you know, you, you implemented some of the rules we provided, and we believe it's reasonably hard to, to get the content out. Now, it won't be impossible. 
That's why we are still in business. <laughs> but um, it's still the goal of making it harder. And this is how you tie it to the blockchain, that um, the, the player actually verifies that it has the entitlement. In traditional DIM terms, this is the license that allows a certain device to play something back. And it's also issued to certain end user, to the, to the ID of, the, of this person. Um, and this is then basically standardizing the, the DRM system or standardizing the way these licenses are exchanged and, you know, in, in some way um, replacing what, what we do or what iTunes do, does with storing it uh, locally and individually. I have a, a quick question about this. So if the license is essentially part of the blockchain, uh, is there a way to revoke that license, or do you limit the license in terms of um, you don't want it uh, valid for perpetuity, or is there a way to to embed a way to revoke that that permission? Yeah, so that depends on the design, right? That depends on on what the what the player does. On um, the the player could ignore some of the um, information in here and and stop playing. Um, and it makes sense, and it's, it's possible uh, for the blockchain system to support other licensing schemes, like uh, pay-per-view, like rental, mm. um, and then limit it, and, and then the, the player will stop. It's also possible to design the system such that the content owner at some point says, well, this media player is not trusted anymore, we revoke the license and the end user cannot play on this media player. I personally think that should never be the case. I personally think the main benefit, the main value for the end user is to trust that once I have the license, I can always play it. And if the media player gets hacked, if the security is not appropriate, content owners will, will have the ability to renew it for, for newer titles, but not for the old ones. But it could be designed either way. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please tap the like button and also subscribe to our channel to receive notifications when we add new content. For more information about us, please visit simpty.org. We'll see you next time.